Welcome everybody to the Milwaukee Beer Summit, the inaugural Beer Summit. Um, thank everyone for coming. Um, if you, you, you went over the housekeeping stuff, we're going to ask a few questions, and then um, we're going to open it up to audience questions, so um, start thinking of those now. Before we get going, I'd like to thank Aldo and his team at Beer Capital, as well as Russ and his team at Lakefront. These events are a tremendous undertaking. They did a fantastic job. All right, so without further ado, let's introduce our panel here. Starting over here, we have Russ Klisch, president of Lakefront Brewery. We have Dick Leiningkugel, business development manager at Tenth and Blake Beer Company. Larry just made it back in time with his beer. Larry Bell from President of Bell's Brewery. We have Joe Martino, operating partner for Stevens Point Brewery. Kirby Nelson, the brewmaster at Wisconsin Brewing Company. Last but not least, Tom Porter, owner of Lake Louis Brewing Company. All right, so we're going to start off with a few lollipops for you guys. Get everyone warmed up here. So tell us when, what, where, and when, where did you have your first beer, your first beer experience? We'll start over here. Kirby, you want to kick us off? Yeah, turn it on, man. Well, when I was growing up, the drinking age was 18, which meant I had my first beer at 16. And uh, I think it was a Heineken and in my basement somewhere. Just one? Uh, one six pack. <laughs> okay, I guess I'm up. Uh, I was a little earlier than 16, actually. Uh, <clears throat> my grandpa had a fridge in his. Uh, in his uh, fish cleaning sh uh, shed out back, and uh, he always had uh, Carling's Black Label, Old Style, a uh, lot of Pabst. I drank a lot of Pabst as a child, and uh, never complained about that beer. I always liked that beer, actually. Is this working? Yeah, I guess it is. Yeah, my, my grandfather worked for Schlitz, and he used to give my father a case of beer all the time, so my dad would always open up a bottle of Schlitz after he came home from work and pour it in a big schooner. And I remember as a kid just going up there and sucking off it a little bit uh, every time until he ch chased me away. But that's how I remember uh, drinking beer when I was younger. So at uh, three days old, I was brought home. <laughs> True story, because I watched my dad do it with my children. But he uh, dipped his hand, or his, his pinky, in a bottle of Lining Kugels and touched it to my lips. But my real first beer experience was um, sneaking a Liney's original, much like your story, out of the fish shack at my Uncle Carl's place, the fish cleaning shack, which had fresh Liney Kugel's original on draft. Uh, when I was growing up, you go to Grand on on Sunday, and you were required to take a sip of grandpa's beer and a puff off of his cigar. Ugh. But, uh, and there's some other early beer, but the one that comes to mind, my first legal beer was when I was 15 in Wisconsin, when we'd go up to the house in the UP. Uh, my dad would always stop at John's Bar, and then the next one was up by Green Bay, the Candle Glow, and I had my driver's permit, 110 miles. Kid, you're done, give me the keys, give him a Pabst. And I got to drink two beers in Wisconsin legally. How great was that? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Um, all right, next question. Um, what was the first beer um, that you, beer style that you brewed at each of your breweries? And then also say what year your breweries were founded. Okay. Uh, January of 2000 was our first legal batch as a legal brewery. And uh, I'd built a three-barrel Frankenstein brew house, and it didn't come with a manual, so I didn't know how much grain to dump in to the mash tun to see how much alcohol I was going to get out. I wanted to make what became the Warp Speed Scotch Ale. Uh, that first batch uh, 
turned out um, that I'd made a really great mash tun. And so I uh, made a lot more alcohol than I thought I was going to. And so that became a, uh, a nondescript beer because I had to sell it to get it uh, the money to make a second batch. And it was called Winter Warmer, but it got the nickname Liquid Reefer after the first week. <laughs> in the first three bars I sold it in. And to this day, that's still, that's the, we do an homage to that beer each year called Louis Reserve Liquid Reefer. So. You need to move to Colorado. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, I'd have to go to a previous brewery, and that's when I, I was involved with Capital Brewery for almost 30 years. Folks, I was on the streets getting thrown out of bars selling micro beer. Never heard of craft beer back then. But anyways, um, we had a German guy initially, and he developed a few things, but it didn't work out, and he moved on. And so the first official beer I did was an Oktoberfest, a Meritzen. And I understand, I'd started working at a brewery. Um, I came from a different angle from most folks. Most folks started in um, small little brewery start with home brewing. I've never home brewed in my life. It looks like it's way too much work. I'd worked at large breweries, and I didn't know the difference between a Weizen and a Meritzen. But you learn that one pretty quick, trust me. But so my first brew I got to brew by myself, I would assume, was Oktoberfest, and to this day it remains one of my favorite styles. The Stevens Point Brewery was founded in 1857. I wasn't around then. Kirby was, but he, he, uh, the first beer we had was Point Special, and we still have that today, and it's still doing well. Um, that's it. Uh, my first, our first beer was called, just called Bell's Beer. It was crap. Um, the first bottled beer was Great Lakes Ale. So uh, we, we had the Great Lakes name we were using up until, I think, uh, 1990. So uh, Great Lakes Amber Ale was bottled uh, first in uh, the fall of 1985. We opened in September of 85. And uh, that has become Bell's Amber Ale today, still around. So my great-great-grandfather, Jacob Kugel came to Chippewa Falls where there was a booming lumber population, the largest sawmill under run roof, and he brewed the beer style, the German lager-style beer that he learned from his father when uh, they came over from Germany. And it was probably called Jacob's Lager. That recipe today is our Kugel's original. We're old home brewers, and my brother tried to imitate Anchor Steam, and I tried imitating Pilsner Yerquell. And so the Klisch Pilsner is actually modeled after that, and the River West Stein is actually modeled after Anchor Steam. And one time we're going to call River West Stein River West Steam. We thought it'd be great if we uh, we did that, and Fritz Maytag sued us, and then we'd be able to uh, get a lot of press off it. But some. Uh, <laughs> Some magazine uh, printed it wrong and called it Stein instead of Steam, and so we stuck with that name. That's a great story. All right, with the tremendous growth in craft beer, how have you guys dealt with individually your, the, the tremendous growth in your breweries? Uh, I've avoided it at all costs, actually. Uh, we're still under 10,000 barrels at Lake Louie. We're a very small place. Uh, uh, my house is 100 feet away from the brewery, so I don't want some big brewery, although I would like to make a living someday. So we've continued to grow the place each year. Uh, we add about 15% capacity uh, every 18 to 24 months. As soon as I can get into the principle of the last loan, I go refinance and can get another loan, and we add on. That's how I add tanks. Yo, know, gang, I've got to add on Tommy P's behalf. Understand, when I first met Tommy, he had built a three-barrel system in his garage, and gang, he did it all. I mean, this is a guy where insomnia became a big asset for, trust me. Um, and what he has done out in this property, when he's turned into it, is a thing of beauty. It's been amazing to watch him, you know, grow from literally just doing a couple hundred barrels a year to what? You're over 6,000 now? Trust me, with this, with what he's done in the facility, it's been amazing. I don't know how I expanded was I left the breweries working out and helped build a new one. Um, we actually have done something that some people kind of question our sanity on. We built Wisconsin Brewing Company. We've just been brewing seven months. We built for success. I thought originally we might start out with a little kind of a hand-operated system. And Carl and a, a friend of ours who we use as a consultant, a gentleman named Bob August, he was the first employee of Sierra Nevada. I should hear his stories. Anyways, they, they sat me down and slapped me hard and said, are you nuts how many times you want to build a brew house? Do you believe in the industry? Do you believe in your ability to make beer? Do you believe in your coworkers? 
built for success. So we basically built a, a brew house that if we ran around the clock and adding some piece of equipment, that's a quarter million barrels. That's a long time down the road for us, but you know, right now we're learning how to run it, and that's how we did it, build a new one. Well, like a, everyone here and a lot of our friends in the craft segment, we've enjoyed good growth over the past decade, and that hopefully will continue. Uh, we seem to be expanding every year. We're adding more tanks, we're adding more uh, rooms, we're adding another brew kettle. Uh, it's, we've been fortunate to do that. I've become very friendly with uh, bank financiers uh, because they've found that's a necessary part of all this. But well, as, as, we, as long as we have the volume, we'll continue to grow and continue to expand and continue to expand, uh, invest in the brewery. Yeah, expansion's a uh, interesting device or to go through. You, you have to play a, a juggling act when you do. It's just not adding more of these tanks around here, but it's adding people, adding warehouse space, adding bottling. It's either usually bottling or packaging equipment, tankage or, or brew house or warehouse or one of those. And somewhere along the line, you always seem to be spending money. And when you've got one you think is ahead of the other one, the other one comes up and be as a short one. But... Um, as long as you keep on the cash flow going right, you can keep on going, and that, that's the important part. So in 1988, we brewed uh, 60,000 barrels of Lining Kugel's beers. At that time, four, four different beers, predominantly our Lining's, Lining Kugel's. Um, our parent company approached us that year and said, we'd like to form a joint marketing venture. That was Miller Brewing Company right here in Milwaukee. So how we expanded was we became a wholly owned subsidiary of Miller Brewing Company, but I give them a lot of credit for recognizing what was just starting to happen in the micro-brew business back then, Kirby, which was people's tastes in beer were changing, and they recognized that Lining Kugels was able to make different styles of beers and to do them at a scale that was much different than what they're able to do them at. So we became part of Miller Brewing Company, now part of Miller Coors. We've expanded our brewery not once, not twice, but three times in Chippewa Falls, plus added a new brew house and a Liney Lodge. And we were able to purchase the 10th Street Brewery right here in Milwaukee, which allows us the flexibility to do some things such as Lining Kugel's, the, the Big Eddie lineup of beers. So we've been blessed that we've had a parent that's willing to work with us, provide us the capital to expand, and to enter new markets and to try new beer styles. Well, right now I'm on office number seven and brew house number seven. And when, when we, we open up Escanaba, I guess that'll be brew house number eight. I don't know that I'll have a dedicated office up there, but certainly each expansion it takes a little bit out of you. Um, you know, it's stressful doing the financing. For us, as we look at doing those things, um, you know, we think about three things. We think about quality, safety, and morale. And, you know, we, we want to make sure that anytime we're, we're putting in new equipment, the first thing we think about is our people and the safety of those people, that they're educated on, on what we're doing. Um, the last thing I, I want to have are any accidents in the brewery. It can be a dangerous business. And by making sure that you have a safe place building, making quality beer, you're going to have good morale. And, and, you know, because the people are the most important thing that you have around the brewery and when you're expanding. You know, doing the expansions, everybody's doing a lot of different things. Some of it's bank financing or people doing ESOPs. There's a lot of private equity money sniffing around. It, rarely a day goes by that I don't get an email or a packet from private equity wanting to, uh, to buy our brewery. Uh, and the packets are getting much more sophisticated. Um, I've actually seen Chase Bank's analysis of the craft brewing industry. You know, I see my name on there. There's a lot of interest in who's expanding and, and how it can be done. And uh, stay tuned. It's, uh, you know, how do you deal with it mostly? At 5 o'clock, the bar is close by. That's how you deal with it. <laughs>